Hello and welcome to the Knowledge Live Facebook Q&As. I'm Tom from the communications team. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, we have a wide variety of knowledge at Keel over a vast amount of areas and we thought we'd get our academics live on Facebook to answer some of your questions. So if you do have a question as we're going through the, the Q&A today, drop it in the comments and I'll get to it if I can. Uh, but today's guest is Dr. Naomi Forrester Soto. Hello, Naomi. Hi. How are we? Oh, I'm doing fine today, thank you. How are we finding lockdown and work from home life? Uh, well, I've got two small children, so between work and homeschooling and, you know, just general life, it's been a little bit of a roller coaster, but we're getting there. Good. Um, so do you want to give us a quick uh, background into what it is you do at Keel and what your area of expertise is? Yeah, so um, my official title is Reader in Vector Ecology, which sounds really um, obscure, but really what that is, is I investigate how viruses interact with their mosquito hosts. So I particularly study um, mosquito-borne viruses. They generally exist in the tropics. Um, you might have heard of dengue virus or chikungunya virus or yellow fever virus. So stuff like that that's transmitted by mosquitoes. Um, and really what I'm focused in is the within host interaction. So how the virus evades host immune systems, how it persists in the host, how it overcomes all the host barriers. Um, so I'm looking at the molecular um, evolution of the virus in order to be able to overcome those barriers. So how do we actually study a virus? How does that take place? Well, <clears throat> most of my students get really freaked out by the idea and think it's going to be this massive thing. But basically, most of the time, I'm just moving bits of liquid from one one thing to another using a pipette. Um, but using the correct tools enables us to infect certain cells with virus and then be able to interrupt at various times or change the dynamic of the cell at various times with certain drugs. And then you can look at how that affects the virus. We can also use tools like sequencing to identify how many, how more the virus is replicating. We can use um, electron microscopy to observe where the virus is in the cell. But because viruses are um, very small, we cannot actually see them with the naked eye or even down a microscope. So we have to use other tools to be able to identify them. And it's I'm, a little more complicated. Yes, yeah, sounds very complicated. So I'm guessing it's very early days, but what do we actually know about this strand of coronavirus and how does it differ from other species? So there are several coronaviruses that circulate, a lot of them in animals, but there are a few that circulate in humans. Three of them have caused severe disease. That's MERS, the original SARS, and the current SARS coronavirus 2. So I'm going to just label them SARS 1 and SARS 2, just in case you're um, confused. Okay. Um, there are also four other human coronaviruses that circulate, but they cause generally cause what we think are the common cold. So most of you have been exposed to them all through, you know, numerous times. Um, you can get them again and again, and they just seem to cause a mild disease. Although we may be looking into that a little bit more, um, having looked at this virus a little differently. Um, so this one is really unusual in that it has both an upper respiratory and a lower respiratory um, aspect to its infection. So most common colds are what we call upper respiratory infections. You know, you get a sore throat, runny nose, um, you feel a bit grotty for a couple of days and then you recover. Ones that cause a lower respiratory infection are more likely to cause what we call a pneumonia. And that's what happened with SARS-1 was it was really very much a lower respiratory infection. And because it was a lower respiratory infection, people actually weren't transmissible until they were feeling ill. So they weren't transmissible until they were feeling symptomatic. So it made it quite easy to track and trace people and um, be able to control it. SARS-2, on the other hand, is both. So you, are, you are, have the ability to be transmissible before you enter um, symptomatic period. So that means that you can run around without anybody, without knowing that you have it. And then you also can unfortunately get a lower respiratory and a severe pneumonia as a result of it. And this is commonly called severe acute respiratory syndrome, which is a very strange long term for just basically a, a really bad pneumonia in, in your lungs. And so as with this coronavirus, people have had a wide variety of reactions to it. Some people having no symptoms at all, some people having really severe symptoms why how how does that happen how do some people have a different reaction to other people with the same virus and um, this is not unique to the coronavirus this happens in a lot of viruses so one of the viruses that was studied a lot in the us in the um, early 2000s was west nile virus because it um 
um, transferred across from Europe to the US and invaded the US and caused quite a big outbreak. And what they found there was that about 70% of people have an asymptomatic infection. Um, and then you have the rest have a symptomatic infection, but severe infection generally is a very small portion of those who have a symptomatic infection. And we think, although we're not sure yet because we don't have the tools to identify this, is that most people have, have an asymptomatic or very mild symptom infection to SARS-2. And that only a few people, and we're not quite sure why that happens, um, will have a severe disease or in some cases, unfortunately, require hospitalization, which can lead to fatalities. So there's this kind of this what we call a pyramid where the majority of people are asymptomatic and then only a few people at the very tip of the pyramid are generally found to have severe infections. Why that's going on? There are a few ideas out there from running the gamut from genetics to viral load to how much virus, that's how much virus you were infected with. But really, we we have no concrete idea at the moment. It's just too soon for us to have been able to tease apart what factors lead to this severe infection. And do we know why some viruses have that incubation period and some don't? Why some viruses we get ill in straight away and we start to show the symptoms straight away and why some that take a, take a week or two weeks to show any symptoms? So then that's just a, um, a variation in lots of viruses. Most viruses, you'll have a flu-like symptom three to five days post-infection. And that's most viruses. There are some that will be up to 10 days. Some can take a lot longer. Um, and that just depends on how fast the virus is able to replicate in your cells and how fast it sort of ca starts causing damage and your immune system starts to respond. Um, but in general, for almost all the human viruses that we work with, you would experience initially a kind of a flu-like symptom. Um, most of the time, it's not until the virus has progressed a few days past that, that we start to be able to differentiate between that um, into the different symptomologies for different viruses. And often it's very difficult to determine um, if they have the same. So any upper respiratory um, virus is going to be very similar to any other resp upper respiratory virus. So it's only by doing testing that we would actually be able to determine which virus you have. And so, so that's kind of an issue. Yeah. So the, the government are now rolling out um, antibody tests, which uh, will assess who's already had the virus. How does that um, help our efforts to tackle the virus in general? So in some respects, this is more kind of a, a useful tool to identify how big a proportion of the population have actually had the virus. Um, how effective that's going to be at helping us uh, plan, we're not sure for the simple reason that there's really no consensus at the moment as to whether or not the, um, the antibodies that you have will end up being protective for a long time. Um, so what the antibody test does is it tests to see if you have already experienced the virus and produced a robust immune response to it. Um, and it's likely that there will be some people who have had the virus but haven't produced antibodies, that maybe their immune system was able to fight it off quickly, and so they didn't actually produce antibodies. Um, some people, on the other hand, especially those that had a really severe infection, are likely to have very high antibodies because they have a significant amount of the virus in their system. What that does is it allows us to calculate really what we call the case fatality rate, which is how many people are likely to die. Um, if, if, you know, if 100 people get the, get the virus, how many of those are likely to die? So that would give us a much more accurate um, understanding of that um, case fatality rate. It will also give us an understanding of how close we're getting to um, enough people being immune to be able to prevent transmission in the short term. However, in SARS-1, people had antibodies at three years, but no antibodies by five years. So it's possible that these antibody responses may drop off over time and you may be able to be reinfected over time. And unfortunately, at the moment, only time will tell us if that's the case. Wow. And so how do you actually test to see if someone's had the antibodies? Obviously, there's the swab test. Is that the only test? Or how do we actually go about testing if someone's had the virus or not? So there are two types of tests that you can use. The first is the swab test that you've all been seeing people get with, you know, the, the swab up the back of the nose and at the back of the throat. Um, this basically tests for the active virus. So for the virus shedding from your throat and your nose. And when we say shedding, that just means the virus is replicated in your cells and it's um, produced lots and lots of progeny and those progeny are being expelled from the cells and back into the environment. So we're testing for that. 
And what we're testing for is the presence of the virus RNA. So that's what's called an RT-PCR. Um, and that's just a fancy term for saying that you take some of the virus, um, you extract its genetic material, and you see if you can amplify specific regions from the genome. Um, and that's one test. The antibody test requires a blood draw. So because you're having to test to see if you've got antibodies circulating in your blood, you have to have your blood taken. It's not as simple as um, a swab test in some ways because you have to have a trained phlebotomist to be able to, take, to, to have the test done. Once that's done, your blood will be taken, spun down, and then they'll test to see if they can find the presence of antibodies. How they do that is they basically use um, some form of protein that's similar, that's, uh, or the viral protein, and then that allows your antibodies to bind to it, and then they can then use a fluorescent antibody against, uh, you know, how they do it, I'm not sure, but it's, it's a fluorescent ELISA, um, and that is just a standard test for determining the number of antibodies. Um, I think they're hoping to get it to be a rapid test, which is how you find out if you've got flu, but we're not sure yet. Do you know how long those tests take? Is, is, does it different in, in how long it takes to get the, re the results from both tests? Yeah, both tests need to be done in a laboratory at the moment. So that means that there is time and um, the length of time really depends on how busy the lab is and how quickly it can process your sample. Sorry, I should say that the flu test is a rapid um, test using uh, viral. Um, you know what? I'm not sure. I'm just going to leave it at that. That's fine. That's fine. Um, <laughs> Do you want to say something that's wrong? <laughs> no, exactly. Um, so, I mean, we've heard this term a lot, the term herd immunity. Um, it's been mentioned a lot throughout the pandemic. Um, what is that and, and how does it help us tackle a virus? So in terms of herd immunity, um, it's a term really taken from vaccines. So when we're thinking about rolling out a new vaccine, we're trying to think about how many people we need to vaccinate in the population in order to prevent a pandemic or an epidemic from happening. Um, so for example, for smallpox, that was about 80% of the population, which was one reason why smallpox was relatively easy to um, uh, eradicate. But for measles, it's closer to 95 to 97% of the population need to be immune but to prevent a measles because measles is just so infectious. And that herd immunity informs public policy and how, how, how you roll out the vaccine and where you need to roll out the vaccine. Um, in terms of this pandemic, the term herd immunity is really how many people need to catch the virus and become immune before the pandemic will, before the epidemic will stop moving through the population. Um, so it can either be done with a vaccine that provides an artificial way of getting, getting new antibodies, or it can be done by people being exposed. Um, so originally, I think everyone thought that this might not be as severe as uh, it was and that there was a hope that we could get herd immunity quite quickly but unfortunately the um, people who are getting sick are getting really really sick and so that's um, how much that's why we had to kind of stop that idea of herd immunity in order to treat everybody who needed to be treated. Fantastic um, that's brilliant they are all the questions I have um, it's really interesting to understand how these things take place and how the virus is studied and, and I guess it's different from virus to virus and there's no framework that you can follow to study a specific virus is that is that right um most of the tools are pretty similar depending on what virus you study um the issue with coronaviruses is, is that they're quite large for rna viruses um not that many people study them they were very understudied sars was the only was the first real outbreak of coronaviruses so there are a few there are a few really expert labs in the world. There are lots of labs who are now working on coronaviruses, but there are a few who have been working on them consistently for the past you know, 10 or more years. And they're probably the ones who are best positioned to do some of the more um, essential, um, more in-depth studies than some of the labs who are just sort of, you know, helping out really to get some of the basic studies done. So would you say we're really only at the beginning of understanding viruses? We, we've only touched the surface, really, of that research that can be done into understanding how viruses take shape and form and spread? Yes. So um, we really only knew about viruses since the 19, early 1900s. Um, tobacco mosaic virus actually was the first virus ever um, discovered. 
But we really didn't have the tools to do much with uh, the molecular biology of viruses until about the 1960s, 1970s. Um, and really it's taken off a lot more since we were able to do large scale sequencing. Uh, and that would have been like late 90s, early 2000s, early 2000s. So we're kind of, virology has exploded in the last 10, 15 years, partly because of the emergence of West Nile virus in the US, um, the um, rise of chikungunya in um, the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean and Zika, of course, and then Ebola as well. And then now this SARS-2 um, has made virology slightly more um, interesting to people. But I think that our tools are still developing and there's still a lot we can't understand because we simply don't have the tools yet to investigate at the molecular level that we would like. It's fascinating. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Naomi, for, for joining me today and explaining all that. Thank you to those who watched. Um, I hope you're staying safe, all enjoying lockdown as much as that is physically possible. Um, but thank you, Dr. Naomi. Thank you again. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.